Department of English at Missouri State University presents Let's Read L'Enval by Marie de France. Hello and welcome to the second uh, in this series of Let's Read videos. Uh, in the first one, we looked at the Old English elegy, The Wanderer, which asks, how does a person live alone? How do you go on? What is your life for when uh, you've been reduced to what Giorgio Agamben, the philosopher, refers to as bare life, the kind of mere animal existence, uh, without the company and the meaning that other human beings provide. Um, in today's reading, we're looking at L'Anva by Marie de France, which is a Breton lay, and it has a lot of uh, characteristics of chivalric romance, which I discussed in the audio lecture. And this text examines, um, quite to the contrary, how do we live with other people? How do we negotiate the different demands that we put on each other? And how do we represent those demands and desires to each other? Um, how do we deal with each other's desire of us? Uh, and how do we do it in the pressure cooker of a court where money, power, fame, and prestige is on the line. It's a court is always um, strikes me as being a bit like a celebrity culture, where everybody doesn't just live, but they perform themselves as well. And this is one of the things that romance, and which uh, Marie de France's early version of the romance-type text uh, takes on. So in L'Anval, of course, um, there's a knight, as we discussed, who is underappreciated, Nobody pays him any attention. He's brave, he's kind, he's courteous, he's good. He's all these wonderful things, but he doesn't get the credit that he deserves. Um, and so one day he's wandering in the woods and a fairy lady finds him and says, I will love you and make you rich and give you everything you ever wanted. I'll give you the, you know, the, uh, my credit card with an unlimited uh, spending limit. And the only thing is, and I'll make love to you anytime you want, but you can't tell anybody about it. You can't tell anybody about me. I have to be completely secret. He's like, okay, deal. Goes back, and um, I love this. Let's let's take a look at the text, okay? So after Gal um, Lanval has gotten back to court, and he's, you know, going around, spending money, throwing parties, ordering pizza for everyone, buying rounds of drinks, Gawain, who is very centrally placed in this court society, he is the nephew of the king, Gawain, who made himself so beloved by everyone, said, My God, my well, by God, my lords, we do wrong not to have brought along with us our companion Lanval, who is so generous and courteous, and whose father is a rich king. They turn back at once, they go back to his lodging, and persuade Lanval to accompany them. The queen was leaning on a window ledge. She had three ladies along with her, she looked at the king's household. She looked at Lanval and considered him. Now, a few basic questions that I want to ask, that I want to bring up here before we sort of unpack some of this. One is, when we approach a text, one of the ways that people commonly do so these days is ask, is this a, is this representation positive or is it negative? Or is this, you know, is Lanval, are women represented positively in Lanval, or are they negatively? And this is an important question, but I think it's also a pretty basic one. I want to take us to a level where we don't just ask, is it positive or negative? But when we talk about positive negative versus negative, we're talking about poles on a scale. Are we talking about positive and negative in terms of strength? Or are we talking about it in terms of... Uh, honesty, right? Positive and negative aren't values in themselves. They merely indicate what, how much something fulfills a value. So I want you to ask, when you read these old texts that we're working on, what are the scales? What are the values that are being defined by this text? And how are the characters being evaluated according to the values that are defined by the text themselves? In this passage, we see some of the values of this culture, of this court society in 12th century French-speaking England, of courtly chivalric society defined. We see, for example, that Lanval we like because he is generous and he is courteous. And these are two key values of courtly society. Um, one should be generous 
That is, one should be free with their money. Now, moral texts from the Middle Ages warn against foolish generosity, you know, maxing out all your debts in order to show off to people. That's considered imprudent. Um, but one should be generous within one's means. And that means being the French term that this translates is the word largesse, which also comes into English. Um, and that's that's to be uh, to be free, to, to not be sort of breaking out the pocket calculator when the, when the when the check comes to the table, right? To be generous is, by the way, related to a word uh, related to the word gentle which is related and, and related to the word kind. And these are both words that have a, a, associations with birth. Both of them, the root of these is birth, like generation. And so, and, and so they're also linked to class signifiers. That is to be a gentleman, to be aristocratic, to be noble, right? So um, a lot of our moral vocabulary in English you know, chivalrous, generous, kind, noble, courteous, are all words that describe people who are literally, um, in pre-modern times, high class. So there's this conflation of class status with moral status that that we still have, really, but and that which comes out of at least the Middle Ages, if not earlier. Um, so generosity is important courteousness is important. And what does it mean to be courteous? It means to behave like somebody at court, right? <laughs> the root of this is court. And so it's kind of a circular definition. This guy's very courtly because he's very courtly, right? And so to behave as a person at court is to know how to behave, to know how to treat people, to know uh, how to um, uh, behave towards people, the, the formulas of politeness, uh, it also in, involves certain degrees of, of accomplishment, right? To be able to carry on a conversation, to be good at music, to appreciate beauty and be able to recite poetry and go hawking and wear the right clothes in the right season and not wear white pants after Labor Day, all those things. So he's generous, he's courteous. These are both moral values. Also, his father is a rich king, right? Let's get that down to brass tacks here. It seems to me fairly likely that Lanval is no more generous or courteous than he was before. Well, he might be more generous now because he has money. But now we're like, oh, his father's a rich king. He can play with us. He's one of us. They turn back at once. They go back to his lodging and persuade Lanval to accompany him. Now, the queen, Guinevere, who is a bit of a troublemaker in Arthurian legends, modern treatments of her are more balanced and sympathetic, but she she basically causes a lot of trouble in most medieval uh, versions of the Arthurian legend, uh, most famously by cheating on Arthur with Lancelot, um, and this causing a, a um, civil war in the court that ultimately destroys it. Uh, you could read that those stories from Thomas Mallory and say that the real problem was the people who had to make a big deal out of it, because Arthur pro seems like he knew and was just like, okay, whatever, but, you know... Um, that's that's I'm going on a tangent there. So let's bring it back to the uh, away from the 15th century and back to the 12th and talk about Lanval. The queen here in this text is definitely not a good person, right? We can we can say is she positively or negatively represented? Well, she's negatively represented, and that's because we can say that that she is a liar, that she is a cheat, that she is unjust. Um, but she is also at the center of this court and at this social world. Um, and one of the things that's interesting here uh, is that she is she never notices um, Lanval before, but now that everybody's into him, she thinks he's pretty great, and she uh, tr uh, invites him to her chambers and tries to get him to sleep with her. Let's turn to that text. After she says to him, basically, um, I am willing to be your lover. You should be delighted with me. He says, lady, he says, let me be. I have no interest in loving you. For a long time I have served the king. I don't want to betray my faith to him. Never for you or for your love shall I wrong my lord. And now he frames his rejection as one of loyalty to the king. Because committing adultery with the queen 
would in fact be treason, right? Um, because, you know, sex can lead to reproduction, which can lead to an illegitimate heir, which would end the dynasty. And this would, and, and in fact, adultery was considered treason. This is how Henry VIII, some centuries later, justified executing a number of his wives. Now she hears this. The queen became furious. She was angry and spoke wrongly. I always think it's interesting when the narrator comments on what's going on. I, the, the, the storytellers will often uh, stay kind of neutral, but sometimes they will come in and they will say, this is good, this is bad, I approve of this, I don't approve of this, this is proper, this is improper. And it always sort of, when I'm reading closely a narrative especially, I always look for those places where the narrator kind of shows their hand and says, this is what I think of what's going on. Um, the queen became furious. She was angry and spoke wrong wrongly. L'enval, she says. Now, now here's, here's, I bet this is a surprise to you when you got here. It's quite clear to me you have no interest in that pleasure. People have often told me that you have no desire for women. You have shapely young men and take your pleasure with them. Base coward, infamous wretch, my lord is greatly harmed by having allowed you near him. I believe he will lose God by it. Now, in contrast to his faith, she sees him as tainting his court, corrupting it by homosexual behavior. This was a particular interest of the 12th century. Um... They wouldn't have used the term homosexuality, of course, which would have been invented, invented in the 19th century as a clinical term. They would have used the term sodomy, which was a moral vice, which was a sin. And in the 12th century, there, were, there was a kind of a, uh, a burgeoning obsession with, with sodomy. A bunch of newfound laws, for example, ones that mandated burning at the stake. Um, so if he sleeps with her, he could be guilty of treason, which means being a burnt at the stake, and if he gets accused, and if he doesn't, he gets accused of being a sodomite, which gets him burned at the stake. Even though it's a private act, it, it was considered to bring public harm and damage the whole community. Uh, for reasons that are explored in interesting ways by the classical scholar Martha Nussbaum in her book, The Politics of Disgust. Um, in any case, sodomy accusations in France were so feared that men openly kept mistresses to ensure no charges were brought against them. Even religious figures, clergymen who were supposed to be celibate, kept mistresses because it was better to have a mist to, to be to be thought of as not a sodomite because you have a mistress than to be accused of sodomy. There was an entire uh, uh, two thousand long line Latin poem called The Complaint About Nature, featuring the allegorical figure of nature appearing as a person and complaining about the crimes against her, if you will. Um, and, and so that there was a lot in the air, culturally speaking, a lot of anxiety about sodomy. It speaks, I think, to tensions in masculinity in the period. Um, if we, ha if if, as I discussed in my audio lecture, chivalric romance and courtly literature was designed to refine the behavior of, of men and warriors, where was the line between becoming more refined and sensitive versus becoming effeminate? If it was designed to promote relation, um, close relationships between men uh, of, of loyalty and vassalage, what was the line between... Um, as Eve Sedgwick puts it in her classic queer theories uh, book, Between Men, what is the line between what she calls homosociality and homosexuality, and what happens when women, as in this case, fail to provide uh, a kind of uh, token of reconciliation or agreement between men? Literature is a space that explores uh, the ideological incoherences and inconsistencies of the culture that produces it. This is one of the things that, one of the reasons I think it is so interesting. It shows the places where we have multiple values that are coming into conflict with each other. It plays out those conflicts through narrative, through stories. Um, longer romances, like TV shows and comic books, 
Um, we know where one story ends and another story... Be- we know that when stories end, another story begins. That there's a kind of one episode after another. Um, a continuity, if you will. That nothing ever really ends. Uh, the Breton Lay um, that, that Marie de France writes, it has elements of the chivalric romance, but it also has elements of the fairy tale, which do wrap things off, t- wrap, them, wrap things up, time in a bow and sends Lanval off into happy ever after land. When the queen accuses him of sodomy and he's going to, or, or of, of assaulting her, I think is what he actually accuses her of. And he stands trial. Um, the, the fairy lady who had cut him off because he, he, um, broke the, the, their agreement. She finally marches in with all these beautiful ladies. And he's like, see, my Canadian girlfriend does exist. And she puts him on his horse and takes him away to fairyland. Um, which is his, the resolution to how does he live in this courtly society is he doesn't. He gets taken away to another magical place. Um, is that a resolution at all? Uh, things that happens in, um, in, uh, in Lanval, where suddenly Lanval is shown as having money, and, and then he gets popular. And then because he gets popular, other people want him. Is a phenomenon that Rene Girard, this um, uh, a Christian literary theorist, refers to as mimetic desire. Um, I'll, I'll I'll put the text overlay there. Uh, and mimetic desire is basically, very basically, what that our desires aren't just generated by ourselves. We want what other people want, and other people wanting stuff makes us want it too. Um, and so we see that uh, played out here in the consequences of it, and we see it at work and the disorder that it causes in courtly society. This video is starting to go a little lo- uh, long right now, but I hope I've opened up some new ways of reading this text for you. I want to leave you with the idea of looking at w- where the narrator is evaluating the text and looking at what are the terms that texts use to describe the values that they care about, that they, that they are testing characters on. Lanval is being um, evaluated on his generosity, his courtesy, his truth, his ability to keep promises. Um, but also he has to def- he's, he's sort of put in this double bind where he's defending his, la- his fairy lady's honor, but also he has to keep her secrets. So he's got these irreconcilable um, injunctions on him. This is a standard trope of romance and one which we will see next week in Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. I hope you will join me as we read that together too. Have a great day.